Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to guide you through your French Revolution reading and study guide for Christmas break. And we'll watch a couple of videos, and that will be it. So you can use your mind map to finish this. Refresh yourselves on the first, second, third estate. And then your first reading, which is attached to your packet. You're going to review some of the things we've gone over a little bit with our mind maps, uh, but it's a short reading. It talks about what happens to King Louis the, I should say, 16th. Spoiler alert. Executed in 173 after conviction of treason. So you're going to create something just like this for Marie Antoinette, a description of her. Uh, the book talks about her spending habits, why she's called Madame Deficit. And then we're going to look in the lecture and also in your reading there. It talks about why Louis is forced to call the Estates General Meeting, or the Meeting of the Estates General as it sometimes was called. So I'm going to start the lecture right now. And question number one, where you start, although France was considered the most powerful country in Europe, why were looks deceiving? So let's start there. Bump, bump, maybe. Pause it. Nope, never mind, I'm not going to pause it. So setting the stage, we're still talking about the background. France is considered one of the most advanced countries in Europe. Remember, it's the center of the Enlightenment, Paris. Culture is highly praised and imitated throughout the world. The, the women of France are leading the way in fashion. The, uh, the great military of France has considerable accomplishments throughout the 18th century. Uh, high praise for their, their high culture. But looks can be deceiving. Many problems in society, government, and economy. We've talked about this. You could answer this actually with your mind map, but I'm reviewing because I think it's helpful. So bad harvest especially towards the end of the 1780s, 1788, 1789. High taxes, and this all comes back to the third estate. So the socioeconomic gap, this gap between the rich and the poor is huge. And remember, most of the people are poor peasants living in poverty. And then do not underestimate or overlook the uh, Enlightenment ideas. So ideas of Locke, Rousseau, Voltaire, who are Frenchmen themselves sitting around in salons talking about these powerful ideas such as liberty, fraternity, and equality. And the government's in debt. The Revolutionary War plus Marie Antoinette's extravagant spending. And when we talk about the Revolutionary War, we're talking about America. So America put, you know, put the French people in debt. Looks can be deceiving. This is actually a dog dressed up as a knight. That's not a knight. It's a dog. So I talked about uh, how France was in debt because of the American Revolution. The United States had called for their support, and they brought it. They were allies against their sworn enemy of England, going all the way back in time to the Hundred Years' War in the 1300s. England and France had been at odds. Thirteen colonies are able to overthrow Britain, the world's great superpower and France's mortal enemy. Think about how powerful that is if the French people see the lowly American colonies able to overthrow the great power of Britain, well, those ideas are going to be powerful for them. So colonies then create their own form of government and draft the U.S. Constitution. Part of the U.S. Constitution was the Bill of Rights, which was added on to protect the rights of states, but it outlined also the natural rights of citizens. First Amendment, you have the right uh, to free speech. You have the right to religion. You have right to assemble. Second Amendment, you have the right to bear arms, right? All of these things become powerful influences when France writes their Bill of Rights, which looks very similar to the U.S. Bill of Rights. Let's take a look at a video that describes that. So we happen to, we answered question eight, question nine. We haven't answered question 10 yet, but let's watch a short video. So salons are places of enlightenment thought. And let's listen in. Across Paris, aristocrats gather to discuss enlightenment authors and the burgeoning age of reason. Voltaire, Rousseau, fresh voices who champion liberty, control of one's own destiny, and religious tolerance. The passion for this new literature is evident amongst the aristocracy. But as enlightenment ideas trickle through all 
levels of society. The drive for equality will begin to threaten the aristocratic way of life. What makes it dangerous is it means you will eventually question why are aristocrats the ones with privilege? Can't we change the world to make it a better place? Isn't progress possible? All of that will eventually undermine the idea that monarchy is natural, aristocracy is natural, and hierarchy is natural. To see Enlightenment ideals in action, one has only to look across the Atlantic, where the Americans struggle for independence from France's nemesis, Great Britain. King Louis wants revenge for his grandfather's defeats and sees an opportunity in the American War of Independence. French military intervention costs the country 1,500 million livres, money raised from borrowing and taxing poverty-struck peasants. The enormous bill hastens an impending financial crisis. America bankrupts France, in effect, because the debt which the French monarchy incurs in order to fight the American War of Independence turns out to be absolutely crucial in the financial situation of the French monarchy because the French monarchy cannot pay those debts. As Louis sends money and troops across the Atlantic, Marie Antoinette is busy incurring debts of her own. Life at Versailles is a never-ending cycle of archaic ritual and formality. There are ceremonies for the waking of the king and... All right, so Louis' wars... The American Revolution puts the people in debt, and this eventually forces Louis' economic advisor, Necker, to tell him, you need to call a meeting which hasn't taken place in 150 years, the Estates General Meeting, for the first, second, and third estates to meet, because Louis needs to tax the first and second estate, which hasn't been done in a long time. So let's pick up right there. So question number 10. This is a reminder slide of the estates. Question number 10, yeah, background. We already talked about this. Debt, bad harvest, made worse by a weak leadership. Marie Antoinette spends a ton of money. She didn't actually say let them eat cake. One way to get the money back is to tax the nobility and clergy because the third estate is out of money. But they don't want that, right? So that's the idea of this political cartoon. The peasants essentially are enslaved and they've got the the first estate the clergy the second estate the nobility and the king on their back and they can't do it anymore so he calls the meeting of the estates general and what he wants to do is tax the first and second estate but he can only he can only do this if he calls the meeting but in the meeting this is how voting works you can vote by order or you can vote by hand. If you vote by order, the clergy gets one vote, counts as one vote, the nobility gets one vote, and the peasants or the commoners, the third estate, they get one vote. Meaning, any issue that comes up, the clergy and the nobility could vote down two to one if they vote by order. So voting by order is where each estate gets one vote. Or, they could vote by hand, where each person here represents one vote and everyone has a vote. If that were the case, the commoners, the third estate, would largely outweigh the first and second estate and they could have some power or say in this meeting. But that's not the way it works. They vote by order in the meeting. And that upsets the third estate. They're vastly they vastly outnumber the first and second estate, but they have no power, no voice, because they can't vote. So National Assembly, the third estate, representatives, the third day of the meeting, they're locked out of the National Assembly Hall. They vow that they will not stop until they have established a new outline for government. They go to the tennis court. They create the tennis court oath, oath which is a new constitution. And they are joined by certain nobles and clergy members who favor the radical ideas. So it's not all or nothing. There were some nobles and some clergy members, first and second estaters, who agreed with their radical ideas and joined them. They were very few. They were a minority, but there were some. 
They said, let us not, not to separate and to reassemble wherever circumstances require until the constitution of the kingdom is established. And that's exactly what they did. We'll come back to the Bastille. Bastille. So we answered number 10. Number 11, and we'll get to number 12. So the National Assembly was the true parliament of the people, what they called themselves, and they drafted a new constitution called the Tennis Court Oath. Let's watch a little bit of what this looked like. Skilled young lawyer and politician arrives at Versailles. Maximilian Robespierre comes to stand before the Estates General as the a voice deputy, of the people to fight for a fair voice for the people he represents, the Third Estate. Robespierre had risen to academic prominence on a prestigious scholarship, becoming an eloquent speaker, prim in appearance, with never a hair nor a phrase out of place. Returning home to the town of Arras, the Enlightenment ideas he had absorbed as a student drove him to become a powerful advocate for the downtrodden. By the time he went back and started to practice as a lawyer, he was reading very widely in the Enlightenment. And Robespierre was someone who, when he was practicing law in Arras, tried to actually bring the ideas of the Enlightenment into the cases he was fighting. In the Estates General, Robespierre and his colleagues are determined to make the nobility and clergy pay taxes. Louis feels threatened by the growing radicalism of the Third Estate. After a six-week standoff, the deputies arrive to find that they have been locked out. Six weeks, I was wrong. It's not three days. It was six locked. weeks. They suspect a plot. They move next door to what we call a tennis court, which was really a handball court, and gather together and swear they will not stop meeting until they have a new constitution. The deputies have declared themselves to be the National Assembly, the true representatives of the people of France. The Tennis Court Oath is one of these great symbolic moments in the history of the French Revolution. You had these people assembled in this great open space of the Tennis Court, raising their arms in this sort of quasi-Roman salute. And for the National Assembly, this was a moment when they realized something of their power and their dignity and saw that they really could defy Francis King. In one revolutionary stand of defiance, the National Assembly is born. It will be a parliamentary body enacting the people's will and addressing their grievances. But grabbing power from the king would not be so easy as signing a simple proclamation. All of these early victories that take place at Versailles are largely paper victories, and they have no teeth to back them up. And the okay, so they need a victory, and the Bastille becomes that first victory. So the peasants, the commoners, and the third estate and their power is scaring the king. And what he does is he works with and against the National Assembly. What that means is he works with them. He's signing documents uh, agreeing to them, but he's tricking them. He works against them at the same time. He sends troops, 30,000 of them, to Paris and Versailles behind their back. In case a revolution comes up, he thinks he can just put it down easily. And on July 14, 1789... Shortly after the bread riots, the people who gathered 28,000 weapons but need gunpowder know exactly where to get it, the Bastille. So this is the beginning of the revolution. The peasants rise up. They charge into the Bastille. They seize the gunpowder needed for the weapons they have, and now they have an entire arsenal. The Bastille itself represents all of the uh, injustice of the monarchy because for years this has been like a secret prison where the monarchy, without trials, could send commoners, maybe those who spoke out against the government, could send them to be held and you would never hear from them again. So this Bastille represents more than just gunpowder. It's a symbol of France's inequality and their injustice that results from monarchical rule. So I'll leave you with that for today. The video will run out and I leave you with this. July 14th, 1789, they're getting ready. They're going to storm the Bastille. Have a good night, everyone.